how do we allow staff to set their boundaries when those boundaries conflict with their job at camp? Hello, Camp Mavericks. Welcome to the Camp Hacker Podcast. My name is Travis Allison. This show is brought to you by Ultra Camp and 5-Minute Fridays. I am a summer camp marketing and strategy consultant, and I am excited to spend this week talking with you and my favorite co-hosts about this topic. Hi, everyone. I'm one of the favorite co-hosts. My name is Chris Hudson. I am the founder and director of Camp Highlight, and I am a camp consultant. Camp Highlight is a one-week sleepaway camp for kids who have LGBTQ plus parents. It is the best camp in at least three countries and counting. <laughs> My name is Gabrielle Rail. I'm one of the camp directors of Camp Oro. Camp Oro is an all-girls camp in the Laurentian Mountains, and we focus on creating a positive environment for gender minorities. And my name is Joe Richards. I'm the executive director at Pierce Williams Summer Camp and Retreat Facility, which is located about halfway between Detroit and Toronto. And we are just an amazing camp. That's all. Just an amazing camp. In this country, in this county, yes. one county, one county. That's all I need. An amazing camp in that county. Yeah. Well, uh, welcome to the three of you. Grateful to have you back for this show. Uh, before we move on to the topic, I want to just remind folks that reviews do help us. It helps us set the topics. It helps us know what um, what conversations were good and what ones you wanted us to do differently. Uh, but we would love it if you went to rate this podcast.com slash camp, click the ratings and reviews button, and then those ratings and reviews can go out to all of the services that people use to decide about their camp podcast listening. Today, I think we're talking about handling the hard part of camp. Uh, partly for ourselves, a lot thinking about our our seasonal staff, but not necessarily seasonal staff. There are definite parts of this job that we require people to be uncomfortable to do it. I think as an industry, we're much better at making that, um, but me more, more creative about how people can be involved in, instead of being uncomfortable. But I'll open this up by saying there's a phrase that I got from Dr. Deb Gilboa, many of you know her as Dr. G, that sticks with me a lot. How do we get people to distinguish between what's uncomfortable and what's unsafe? And as part of camp, as part of having a job, as part of new experiences, certainly as part of caring for other people's kids, there are times where you are going to be uncomfortable, uh, where you need to put the needs of somebody else for a short period of time above your own. And there are also times that things could be unsafe, which we're not advocating for. We don't want you to do unsafe things. But so I, I think it's an important distinction between um, unsafe and uncomfortable. And it is potentially, honestly, this discussion is coming out of last episode, Joe's tool of the week was a great book. Um, and it, I've been thinking about it ever since Joe mentioned it, that um, thinking about this topic ever since then. And the thing that stuck with me is sessions that staff are required to have as part of their job or part of our insurance they have to check off that they, you know that has to be a part of good health and good human resources management but are uncomfortable for them and people choosing to leave instead of coming up with a way to absorb the material that it was more comfortable so it's pretty broad but it is something i think all camp directors have faced where staff staff have said no, I have to. I have to leave. I have to check out of this, etc. But haven't offered the alternative because I'm a big advocate for this. When we were discussing this topic, I was talking about a staff member of ours who was a genius. He was awesome. He was great with kids. We loved him, and um, we knew his background. There was no way that we would ask him to go through a session on child abuse um, because of his lived experiences. And so, um, I. I wouldn't force a staff member to go to a session that was unsafe for them in that way. Uh, we but Travis, we you're not, you haven't defined what safe is. You're using that unsafe as unsafe mentally, not safe as in physical safety, right? And I think that is, that's where this whole conversation can start is about what safety are we protecting? Are we protecting the safety of their physical being, which I agree with all campers and whatnot. And and by protecting someone's safety for mental 
and feelings, are we really protecting them? Are we setting them up to not be successful once they get outside of our small little perfect world? That's a good question. Uh, but, and but it looks Joe, like Chris but, Hudson's got a thought on oh, it. But Joe, Chris, it's Chris like... Chris has a hand on his face. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, Go to YouTube, my, everybody. Check out Chris's face I right now. I have my head in my hands. But Joe, like, I don't... Listen, I don't see the utility in separating out different kinds of safety. Mm. Like, if we are keeping our children and our staff safe, then we're keeping them safe. And I think in, in the, the common parlance nowadays, like, we understand that physical and mental safety you know, joined forces to like constitute our idea of what it means to be safe at camp. And so I think I, I, I want to have this conversation, but I, I don't want to combine things that aren't combined. It's one thing to ask, how do we challenge staff to grow, to gain skills, to fail and try again, while making sure that we are not triggering any trauma when we are not asking them to go far beyond their abilities while we take their abilities into consideration. I think I, I just don't, I mean, also, I want to be really clear about this. I do not want this to be a generation bashing, bashing conversation. I think I think this is a good question to ask um, for camp for camp staff today, but also of yesteryear. Like, let's talk about what has worked. We've all been through a situation where we have worked at a camp and have our boundaries pushed. I just don't want to rest on the idea that we are materially different from young people today. We've dealt with different things, but they are not some weird alien creature with brains that then we understand development is still development. Is that, is that clear? Like, I just, I want to set the tone for this conversation because I don't want it to be like, young people suck because listen, not for nothing, camp directors are saying that all over the country because we're frustrated by, by this topic. Yeah, but it not is, for just this generation. But it is, it is though, there is access to this generation and having language uh, that- Gab, that, I'm sorry, would you mind starting that answer over again, yeah, please? Not, 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 not at all. I was going to say there is a, a value in talking about generations because this generation does have language and, and, and has been taught language and has also absorbed the language through like social media and- we're in an opportunity to teach them what the difference is between being triggered or uncomfortable. Um, yeah, and, and emotional safety is just as valid, of course, when it comes to physical safety, but that is also generational. Um, my parents certainly are understanding that more, but it was definitely not their experience growing up whatsoever. And, and because you know I'm in the camp industry, you know, we're, we do try to look at, at safety. Now, first and foremost, we can't create a safe environment. It's not possible. It's a, a safer environment. That's, that's how, how we want to, how we want to do this. Second of all, our staff are there to take care of campers, of children. And to Joe's point, they do need to be trained and they do need to hear the difficult things. So they know what to do, but sometimes when we're talking about emotional safety for staff, I think with camp directors, there's a frustration of you can't just opt out because you're uncomfortable. You you do need to be trained. And how do we bridge that gap? And I think that sometimes there's, you know, the simplest of ways is actually asking your staff when it comes to our campers, how do we help them, you know, decipher between uncomfortable and unsafe? You know, I've, I remember a camper saying to me, um, I, I, uh, um, I don't feel emotionally safe to sweep the cabin. <laughs> and so my staff member was like, how do I deal with that? And I was like, we take it very seriously and we have a long conversation and then they're going to get really, really bored. And they're like, fine, I'm going to do the cabin, you know? Um, but, but is talking to our staff members first and foremost about, you know, what does that mean? How do we recognize it? How do we support our campers? And you could do activities and exercises and, and have discussion groups about it. And then we can apply it to ourselves when it comes to the job that we are doing. This is the gamut of things that we need to do. Why is it important for us to participate? If you're triggered, you can't really listen. But what is your responsibility if you do step out? Um, you do have to come back. We do have to sit down during mealtime, you know, these setting those expectations. Um, I get triggered from things. There are certain things I can't stomach. I can't watch. Um, but I've, I've learned 
the difference between what is triggering and what's uncomfortable. And I think with our staff, they haven't learned either. And as somebody that is a connoisseur of TikTok, the word trigger comes up extremely often. And um, can I just break in? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to, just a, a Wikipedia moment. The word triggered as used in like the common vernacular now, this comes from exposure therapy. So exposure therapy is like, oh, I'm afraid of snakes. So what the therapist will do is trigger you slowly and carefully by introducing snakes to you. So you are successfully triggered enough so you can work through your anxiety. Triggering is a good thing. It's a way towards health. It's very interesting to me how in the last 15 years, this has been transformed to something that must be avoided at all costs. So it's it's interesting the way that, you know, language is important. And so I, to, to Joe's point earlier, I think it's, or Joe didn't make this point, but I fear that he's going to. I think we need to be, <laughs> <laughs> we need to be challenging and triggering the staff because we want to push their boundaries. But I think this topic is like, I mean, how do we get them to buy into this process is the question that I, I think that we're going to end up into. Yeah, yeah. Joe? So to Chris's uh so to, to make sure we're on the same, so the book that that triggered this conversation to happen was the, the coddling of the American mind, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. And, and this came to my attention through our previous co-host, Dan Weir, mentioning that he was thinking about it as he was preparing staff training and, and working with kids. And so that is the, that is where I came to the book through. Um, and I think about last summer and after, so we didn't run camp for two summers and um, and I didn't play a huge role in staff training because there's just so much other stuff going on um, with camp starting again and, and other issues. Um, and so some of the leadership team thought that you had to put these safety valves in place to allow staff to have this safe, environment where their feelings can't get hurt. Hurt feelings doesn't imply unsafe, just so we're all on the same page. Um, um, triggers aren't always a bad thing, right? The book speaks about the tree, um, three great untruths that we're sort of passing on to a generation. Um, and one of those is this idea that that which does not make us stronger, or that which does not kill us makes us weaker. Right, so I grew up with a, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. So when I go through adversity, if I'm stressed or anxious about that adversity or learn something or fail at it, I, I look for the lesson in it so I can go out the other side stronger. And some of the, the wording and the reuse of the, the wording triggering is in the way that it's been used now is this is this fear from my side, and, and I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a social worker, the fear from my side that um, that people, when we say safe space for emotions, we're trying to never hurt their feelings. We're trying to never have them be a, have a diversity that they need to think through. And as an employer, so set aside if, if, in a camp world, as an employer, there's just some things you're going to have to do as an employee. Right, you're you're mandated by the government in Ontario that if somebody reports child abuse to you or con confides in you, you need to deal with it in a certain way. And and if a staff session on child abuse is going to cause you to be uncomfortable or relive something, you know, then we need to work through that because what we don't want you to work through that when a kid comes you know, confides in you by yourself late at night at, at camp out when, you know, when your other staff are asleep and the kids are asleep and, and, and then you get triggered. Like what's, I don't know, I don't know the positive outcome in that situation. And so I think that staff training is certainly different than, than every day during the, the summer. But for me, that just comes down to expectations. And again, that it's setting the expectation that no environment is a safe environment. It's it, our goal is to get to a safer environment. And and what is our goal at camp? And and I think sometimes we we don't always 
express what does the comfort zone mean? What does growth zone mean? What does that feel like in your body? You know, when do you know you're panicked? Is that, I like using the word panicked because I think that just keeps it central. Um, and it doesn't mean you had to have a negative experience in the past. Just you're panicked. You're overwhelmed. I was really excited to climb the climbing wall. Now I'm on the climbing wall. I'm two feet up, but I'm freaking out. Like these are things that we can have conversations about. And then we can talk about it in the context of professionalism. What does it take for us to do things here? Does everybody feel great uh, being on stage on the first day? Talking about sequencing with our campers. Um, you know, we don't immediately do, you know, the human knot on the first 20 minutes because that's very close contact. We build up to that. We're going to do the same for, for sessions. Uh, with some of our sessions at camp, we highlight them as red sessions, yellow sessions, green sessions, and blue sessions. Red sessions are what is necessary by law for all of us to do. Um, uh, orange sessions is specific to people's jobs. Green sessions is et cetera, blue sessions, et cetera. They're all valuable, but it is important that they understand. I think sometimes staff look at camp directors and even parents look at camp directors and don't see that they're this is a plan that we've put in place. We also follow rules and regulations, thankfully, because we're taking care of people. And this is sanctioned as government saying, you need to do this, just like we have to do our water tests, et cetera, et cetera. We have to inform our staff members. And then what is the exception when you can't do something? What are the options? How do we deal with that? Um, and, and yeah, and translate it for this is how we do it for campers as well. Not everybody's gonna fit in this box. How do we manage those campers? I understand young camp directors trying to create a safer space and saying like, if you're triggered, you may leave and da da da. For me, that's that's something that's, that's an uneducated um, young camp professional that's trying to be very caring and kind without necessarily training. And I do think that Mental wellness training is important. I do think trauma-informed care uh, training can be helpful, but I think also how we support our young camp direct professionals and how we talk to them about how we're creating these spaces is necessary too, because it's it's it can backfire. And I, I had that happen this summer. Somebody disclosed something in front of my whole staff that was quite uncomfortable and I had to stop the session. But I had a lot of staff afterwards be upset and say, you didn't create a trigger warning. I didn't know that the person was going to disclose something. This was, and I had to talk to them about that. That's, that's, I understand it. I also had to leave. It was a little overwhelming. Um, but there's like, it's almost like, how do we have those conversations? How do I bring it up? How do I take responsibility? But isn't that like the easiest thing in that sense, Gab, to say, I didn't create a trigger warning because the world doesn't give us trigger warnings. I didn't know it was going to happen. And this is going to happen numerous times in your life. And this is the education. I agree with Joe here. That is the education, right? Yes, like I agree too. On this one thing, Chris agrees with On me. this one Please thing, I agree with down. Joe. You two yes. agree all often, okay? <laughs> we, we agree. Or just Our tone is different. It's you true. Know, Very true. I want to say, like, <laughs> and we were talking before we started recording. Me and Joe agree more often. That, like, we agree secretly more often than people would think. Like, I am a stickler. And when it comes to this, listen, I mean, obviously I've been doing this for a long time, right? And also I'm a social worker. I've had to sit through trainings where we look at pictures of the aftermath of physical abuse. I've had to sit across from people who have uh, molested their kids, have killed their, their partners. I've sat across from kids who have had these, you know, really terrible things. Now, the question is, does that mean that all social workers are drawn from people who have never had anything bad happen to them? No, of course not. But the idea is that if we want to do this job, we have to sit through this training. Now, I mean, uh, and I don't want to harp too much on this because I don't want too much information about this, Travis, but like if you have a staff member who has suffered through sexual abuse, right? Like, uh, what is it? One in One in four girls before the age of 18 and one in nine boys before the age of 18. That's a lot of people to accept them from receiving information about how to serve others in similar situations, I think it's just really a step too far. I, I, but that's that's just me, especially if you are coming into a job where you are tasked with maintaining safety for young people, you are going to have to push a little bit. And if you discover in the pushing 
that your boundaries are being violated to the point where you can't handle it, then sweetie, this isn't the job for you. And I know, I know that this is very controversial because we're in a moment where we tell everyone that they can do everything, but everyone can't do everything. And I think that is something to discuss with camp staff at, at, during the marketing of the job and the hiring of it. Like, listen, we've all had, well, we've all, let me not generalize. I had this experience when I was a freshman in college where you show up someplace, you meet people you swear are destined to be your best friends and you like trauma dump on them. You think about like your freshman year, like you, the things you shared with people you just met, right? Because that's developmentally where you are is exploring and trying to set up boundaries. Now we invite these people to come work at our camps. What do we think is going to happen? Of course, in the middle of the training, they're going to reveal that they have been raped or that they have been abused or that they, you know, whatever. And, and Joe's right. Like life doesn't come with trigger warnings, right? You all here are learning, like staff, you all are learning about boundaries and how to set them up. And I think we can be a place that be like, listen, this isn't a therapy thing for you, but you know, understanding their developmental level and understanding where they're at and, and meeting them where they're at. Like, let's have some work about boundaries. Like you all met each other. Have you decided what, how, what you're gonna share with each other? I mean, that sounds really interpersonal. Like maybe as administrators, we shouldn't get involved, but this is an education for them that will help them in their job. And what should you not share with each other? Okay, what are we not sharing with campers? You know, I don't know. This is like a whole thing. But I think I did a five minute Friday on, but so everyone go back and check that out. But uh, I mean, I think in, in summary, I think one, don't have feelings at work. That's just me. I don't have feelings at work. I have goals and I have boundaries, but I don't have feelings at work. You can't hurt my feelings at work. I'm working. Um, that's me. But I just feel like we should move into a space where we stop talking about our feelings getting hurt and more about like, oh, this is beyond my boundary. I can't handle it right now. This isn't for me. Rather than wah, 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 I need everything to stop and cater to me. Like you're at work. We can't do that. But okay. So feelings are, feelings energy. That's all. It's I'm angry. That's an energy. Uh, I'm sad. That's an energy. And I think that I'm overwhelmed is also an energy and it has to go somewhere. And and uh, so feelings at work for don't, you know, I wish I could be like, they don't exist. I think they maybe did a long time ago, um, but there's an opportunity to teach staff members how to manage their feelings. You, of course, you're not responsible for teaching everybody to human, but we, we are able, I think, to set up expectations during our interview sessions, um, you know, long, I don't know when in Camp Hacker, but we talked about a long time ago, um, you know, questions that you ask first year applicants. And I think I remember Joe saying, I asked, you know, what book, what book are you reading right now? And mm -hmm. it's really, really telling. And I think you might've adjusted it to also podcast after I was like, I don't read the books, but I do have the podcast. Yeah. yeah. Podcast yeah. music. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's very telling. And I think that in interviews, there's a place for, for asking certain questions when you're seeing that there's themes that are coming up and it's not, it's not about, um, you know, your feelings necessarily, but it's a, about saying we deal with tough stuff and we talk about tough stuff. How, where, where do you stand on that? And starting, starting it there, we're, we're going to go through trend, trends, uh, you know, constantly interviews is a place where we can sort of adjust and, and set our expectations. Um, and, but we have an opportunity to teach staff, like, what do you do with this? And listen, if you feel unqualified, like I do when it comes to talking about these things, cause I feel like I'm still learning, bring in an expert, uh, reach out, find somebody like Chris that could maybe come Her to Chris. your camp and, 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 and help you have those conversations. And sometimes even if you have the knowledge and you can, um, express, you know, everything as well as Chris can having somebody else come and say it is, is more powerful because again, it's not just coming from you, just like the session on abuse. It's, it's not something that we're trying to harm our staff with. We need to inform people. But when I say this is a red session, that's because it's been sanctioned by the Quebec camp association and the Ontario camp association. And the information is checked here. 
Sometimes I think it just comes from my brain that I'm randomly putting together. Um, and I do think bringing somebody in and talking about these differences, like th the whole thing about triggered, I didn't know that background in, in the language of what that is. I find that very fascinating. And I think this is helpful to, to bring in staff training. Can I just clarify about what I said about feelings? Um, first of all, I take nothing back, but I just yes. want to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, feelings energy is there. I think Did your I'm feelings get hurt, Chris. Did my, my, I, hurt? I was afraid I hurt other people's feelings. No, but uh, what I want to say never. about feelings is that, like, yes, energy is there. Like, and sometimes I get frustrated at camp. Sometimes I get really sad. Sometimes I get really angry at staff or campers. What I what I mean by there's no feelings at work is that I then do not take those feelings and make them part of the group process. These are my feelings to process, right? If, mm -hmm. if, a, if a coworker makes me angry, instead of like going behind backs and talking and making a really big drama about it, I need to have the skill to address my own feelings, figure out how to process them and then work through them. That's what I mean. Like, because, and the onus is on me to work through them because I am at work, because I cannot fall down because I cannot take off six hours to deal with my frustration that arts and crafts didn't go the way that I wanted. That's what I mean, that there are no feelings at work. Like, there, like listen, love my staff. I love them. I care for them. What I can't do is therapize them or treat them because I'm busy taking mm -hmm. care of other people's children. And so should you. And, and so setting up a way to do that. That's you're what talking I'm talking about self-regulation. Yes. And that's a thing we're trying to teach campers. And I think that's one of the best ways to talk to staff members, honestly, when it comes to these type of things is to talk to them because what we're dealing with them is what they're going to be dealing with with kids anyways. So we talk about self-regulations. How do we want to do that? How, how do we want campers to regulate? How can we support them? And then you bring in every once in a while as a staff member, I might blah, blah, blah. What are your things? What do you do? What is acceptable at camp? What happens if you, if a one minute break isn't enough? Um, what happens if this becomes a chronic thing, you know, setting up those expectations, but self-regulation is also something that is practiced and is you tolerate stuff and you learn how to tolerate. And then you learn how to express those energies in a way that's constructive, that you're not pushing on other people. I will say also, I've seen the other side of campers and staff members really powerful with their emotions that I'm learning from. And I remember a 16 year old when we were having a, I walked into their CIT cabin, they were having a moment and one CIT just started sharing a lot of personal things. And another CIT just said, Hey, I, I don't know if you've checked in with everybody to see if it's okay to share this stuff. Um, so maybe we just do that. And I was like, uh, I'm still learning how to do that in the moment. And it was really kind and it was really lovely. I've also seen staff members that are 20, 21 years old, be able to hold space for others the way I'm still learning how to do. And that's because they're being raised by parents that are quite emotionally aware. And that's why they work at our camp because they get to practice those muscles. They truly are muscles, but they don't trauma dump and they don't walk out when they, they'll say, this is really overwhelming for me. They leave for a bit, they come back, they take responsibility. We can get our staff there, but I think we're all fumbling a little bit on how to do that, basically. I think my my final thoughts on this would be that it's it's a process. We're 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 dealing with this generation, you, yes. and we'll deal with the next generation, and then I'll retire, and uh, then right, like we deal with what comes up, and what what the book is helping me see is that this is a this is something that we need to think about but it's also a learning opportunity not only for us and how to train people but to give people a learning opportunity to have them understand that the world is not the world in general is not a safe space the world is is going to challenge you the world is going to push you um and and i'm not saying that that's our job to to do but I do, I do agree with the fact that this job is not for everybody. And I do agree with the fact that um, the sooner, you know, just because you loved camp as a camper does not mean you're going to love camp as a staff member 
or that camp is going to love you as a staff member. That you can successfully make that transition to seeing camp from the other side where, you know, your camp experience has been, you were put first. Yeah. And that you have to be. And, and, And the reality, and I say to my staff all the time, Travis, is that, you know, no matter how good of a friend you think I am to you as a staff member here at camp, camp comes first and campers come first. And so when I make decisions, know that it's not, I don't like you, know that it's about camp and in this place and making sure that we, that we give the, the campers all that they need to, to be here. Excellent spot for well us to wrap said. that up. Well said. Thank you. It is time now for our foam head of the week. I mean, it's time for our tool of the week. Um, you, this is the, you, you really want to be watching this episode on, on YouTube. You really do. Um, Zoom's not showing you what we see because Zoom always highlights the speaker. Um, so Joe, I'm going to give the floor to you for your tool of the week first so people can see your glory. Awesome. Uh, my tool of the week is a card game. Um, and the card game is, just wait a second, I need it, is Point Salad. It's very simple. The reason I think this is super, uh, super good for summer camp directors and, and camp people is always having something to pull out or to shut your brain off, right? Like, and just do something else. Um, I know that when I was at um, the Taylor Staten camps, we always used to have a game, a card game every night in our cabin that the section heads could just wander into and pick up. And we used to play flux because you can literally just pick up three cards and start (laughs) and join the game. But point salad is a a nice, great game and uh, easy to play and very affordable. Thank you so much, Joe. Who is your foam head for this week? Uh, This week's foam head uh, is the Indiana Pacers. No, nope, Colts. that's basketball. Colts. Colts. The Colts. And this was actually, I was invited to a game by another camp director and uh, who had season's tickets. And so I bought the uh, the Colt foam head. Boom. There you go. Thank you, Joe, for your tool and your foam head. Uh, all right, Gab, what's your tool? My tool is a heated um, belt that you can put around your waist. I've got it right here. Oh. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but there's little lights on um, and change different temperatures. My brother Morgan got this for me for Christmas. And I'm just going to speak to the people that have uteruses that are listening. Um, so, you know, when you have cramps and it's, it's not bad enough for you to just be in bed so you can work, but it's really uncomfortable. I had one of those days and then I was like, oh yeah, this heated thing. Uh, I put it on and all of a sudden I was like a hundred percent and that's really never happened for me. It has a front heating pad, back heating pad. It's uh, really, really soft. And he got it for me because I get cold really easily. Um, So why I'm bringing it up is for two reasons. One, if you have people that have uteruses at camp, maybe you'd like to invest in one or two um, because there's one thing about being attached to a heating pad or a magic sack. You can't keep that on you all the time. So it really just makes a difference. Um, or if this is just a little over your budget, it's about a hundred dollars. Um, there are, uh, heating pads that you can get at the pharmacy that are just like reuse, not reusable, like one One time, time, but they do stay for like an hour and people that have back problems. Sometimes more. Yeah. 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 Uh, Yeah. Actually quite a long time. Um, so, just something that I think is nice to have uh, in your health center for for people that might need to use it. Yes, or you yeah. for your own comfort. Yep. Chris, what's your tool? Uh, vibing off of uh, something Joe said about just like turning brains off. Like I am in, I'm on vacation right now. And I just want to share this experience I've had with listeners is that the other day, I did not think about work for an entire day like in from when I woke up to the following morning and I can tell you that has not happened in I can't tell you actually I can't tell you I don't know when that's happened and a couple of weeks ago I recommended the book you are here by Thich Nhat Hanh who is a Buddhist monk 
Um, and I, it really was helpful. And I think reading that book has brought me to this place, which I'm really enjoying. So I'm going to sort of double down on that recommendation. And uh, one, check out that book. Two, I want to recommend a website. Uh, it's mindful.org slash how dash to dash meditate. Listen, meditation isn't for everybody. When I tried, I would often just fall asleep. But meditation is more than just sitting and saying like, ohm and trying to like see the universe with your third eye. It's just really placing yourself in your body and paying attention to the things that we don't pay attention to because we are so distracted by everything else. Listen, I have, I run a summer camp and I have a consulting business and I also have friends, family and errands to do. Uh, and it gets the most of me. Uh, it gets the most of me most of the time. So if you're anything like me, uh, as a busy professional, and uh, if turning your brain completely off for a day sounds great, then find a way to do that. And if it's not meditation, um, it, I don't care what it is. If it's meditation, if it's like literally sleeping all day, uh, anything that's healthy for your body, I suggest that you do it. But check out that website first, give it a read. It answers all your questions about meditation and just try it. You can try it for five minutes. And if you fall asleep, great right? You did it. You achieved relaxation. That's the point. Thank you very much. My resource is, um, I suppose, a more professional resource than a personal one. Uh, it is the website loveandlogic.com. And that's, and is spelled out. And um, the, the founder is Dr. Charles Fay, and they have some great resources for parents and teachers. And I must acknowledge that I got this resource from Sue Levy, who is a, a former camp owner, former camp director. And she's talked about all the great stuff that she's, um, that she's discovered from the Love and Logic group. And they have great practical resources, trainings. Their motto is, we help you raise strong, happy, responsible kids. And so there's lots of really great stuff there for camps, for your own training. You can get trained as a Love and Logic trainer, which may be something that would be helpful for people for their own staff training, since that's been a topic today. Um, there are just some great resources, highly recommended. And I want you to check that out. Dr. G and I are going to be interviewing Dr. Charles Fay on our Apparently podcast. Um, and that's uh, all because of Sue. So if you are also a camp director um, who has great tools and you want to share them with us, please email me, travis at gocamp.pro. Um, we'll be happy to to talk them out, uh, to share them out with the, the crew. Um, and there is a back of my head, a, a deep wish that we have not just our own tool of the week episode, but we have a pre-summer every camp pro you know, 50 camp pros share one, some, one tool they're going to make use of this summer. So maybe we'll get to that just in case um, we don't send stuff to Travis at gocamp.pro. I now want to spend some time and talk to you about Ultra Camp. Ultra Camp is a, a long-term sponsor of Camp Packer, and we're super grateful to them for all that they have done for us and what they do for the camp industry as well. So there are some specific thoughtful things that that ultra camp does in their software and just other stuff as well we know that some people have struggled this year with uh staffing and we also know this is definitely a lesson that gets reiterated on the camp code podcast over and over again that we can and should be communicating with our people um before we need to before we need them to apply for camp etc and ultra camp creates a staff communication calendar that includes the prompts things for you to write ways to keep in touch and you can download that for free at ultracampmanagement.com slash camp packer ultra camp knows that you didn't get into this job because of your passion for paperwork because of uh, all of the paperwork that you wanted to do that you had real reasons for making a difference in staff and kids lives and ultra camp wants to free you up to do that they want to build a platform they built a platform that streamlines the management stuff so you can get on to making a difference in people's lives with ultra camp you have no more need to learn and remember lots of different platforms to run the whole camp with ultra camp you can register and manage campers generate and direct the communication organize schedules and activities process payments and donations ultra camp's goal is really to keep camp pros like you having less time that you're required to be in the office and more time out there making a difference. If you want to know if Alter Camp is the right fit for you, you can get a free customized demo session and the free staffing communication download at 
altercampmanagement.com slash camphacker. Thanks, Gab, for being on the show today. Thanks, everybody. I loved it. Right on. Joe, thank you for this topic. It was great. I'm really glad we got to spend some time on it. Me too. Thanks, Travis. See you, Chris. Have fun in the rest of your time in a warm place. Believe me, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. Okay. I believe you. Um, I, I mentioned Camp Code. I've mentioned every, all of our other podcasts today. I did mention Camp Code, which you should be mainlining at this point in the year, getting ready for staff training. It's a great show. I do want to bring a special attention to First Class Counselors, where Matt and Oliver are talking to your counselors. They are spreading the lessons that we have talked about here practically to your counselors. They can subscribe for free if you refer to them. I know camps that require people to subscribe to it and listen to specific episodes um, as part of the pre-camp get to camp better able to handle camp. So they've done some great episodes this year and we're really excited um, that they do that. Grateful that they give that to the camp industry. And I'm thankful to the three of you. I am thankful to everybody who listens and watches the show. And I want to say in conclusion, thanks for the evening, friends. <laughs>